Uh, good morning. Let us get started uh, lecture 2. So, yesterday we had seen some very basic introduction to embedded systems and real time systems and we had said that uh, embedded systems constitute majority of the real time applications, but of course, real time systems are not confined to just uh, embedded applications, the application also elsewhere as we will see later. Yesterday we had seen some example applications of real time systems, embedded systems and uh, we had seen a basic structure of the embedded systems and we had said about uh, different types of sensors, actuators and then these signal need to be conditioned and then there is a computer processes this human interface <coughs> to configure and uh, control. So, let me just ask one or two questions before we get started, uh, just to check that you are following the course. So, can you just name one or two sensors and the principle on which these are based? Anybody would like to name just a sensor? Temperature which sensor. Can, temperature sensor. Okay. So, what will be the principle on which it will be based? Thermocouple. Okay. Thermocouple. Any other sensor? Okay, light sensor. So, what will be the underlying principle? Right. So, photovoltaic, photovoltaic electricity. So, that is the principle. Pressure sensor. So, what will be the physical principle behind that? How? I mean, you just apply pressure to anything, it will not convert to electricity, is not it? So, what is the? Yeah, piezoelectricity. Okay, fine. So, let us uh, proceed further with uh, our discussion. So, today we will uh, look at some very basic characteristics of real time systems. So, that when we start discussing about the operating systems, we will keep these in mind. So, I <coughs> will just have one or two slides which we had already seen yesterday, just for continuity. We had said that a system is real time when we when we describe the behavior of the system, we need to express time quantitatively. But uh, the question is how do we express behavior of any system? Suppose you are asked to describe the behavior of a system, let us say anything, maybe a mobile phone or something. So, you are asked to describe, given a system, you are asked to describe the behavior. So, what will you do? How will you describe the behavior? Yeah. The behavior is given in terms of the input output behavior basically. So, what are the functions it supports? The function, each function would basically require some input and uh, then that will produce some output. So, we have to list out all these functions and the kind of input and output and uh, if such description of the behavior requires some quantitative notion of time, we have a real time system, but every function may not be real time that we have to keep in mind, right. I, I think as we proceed this point will become clear. <coughs> so, we, we, this diagram just shows that, that uh, there are events. That are, that are recognized by sensors in embedded system and the processor processes these and produces external output. Just an example is a automobile system, we had seen that whenever the sensor detects a collision will be processed and what needs to be done, inflating the airbag and ejecting it will be done in 10 millisecond or less, otherwise the system will fail. So, yesterday we were just observing this diagram, very basic diagram, but we have to keep this in mind as we proceed. So, the kind of systems that we will be talking of, there will be a CPU which will be getting data from events from sensors or maybe data and uh, converted analog to digital conversion and then read by the CPU 
and uh, these are processed by the software and uh, output is produced and the output is converted and drives the actuator can be a motor or can be a hydraulic pump or whatever and uh, we will have some memory in the system as I was saying that in these kind of systems we will not really have magnetic memory very rare in embedded system to have magnetic memory. These are normally semiconductor memory for, but uh, as we know that semiconductor RAM, RAM memory is volatile. So, how do you store permanently data? ROM is not being used very frequently now, it is getting obsolete. We have flash memory. So, flash memory like your pen drive, no, you have gigabytes of memory available in flash memory. So, wh what exactly is a flash memory? Just to just to get things right, because later we would not see those hardware details. What exactly is a flash memory? For example, your pen drive, what is it? Semiconductor, but uh, what kind of semiconductor? Is it a ROM? Is it a RAM? Is it what? What is it? Uh, sorry, can you uh, please repeat again? Permanent, but how can you get a permanent memory in silicon? Okay, it is a type of electrically erasable programmable reader memory. So, EEPROM, but uh, EEPROM existed from long time, we did not have flash memory that time, is not it? EEPROM is not really flash memory because uh, these had restrictions on the storage. You write bitwise there and required high voltage, but in a flash memory, you write in a flash several kilobytes of data read and written in one operation. So, these have more efficient and the writing occurs at 5 volts. Earlier in the EEPROM, you need a special EEPROM programmer which will generate I think 24 volts or something, right? much more higher voltage was necessary because tunneling of electrons is required. Right? So, here similar principle, but much more improvised and read and write occurs in large chunks of data, several kilobytes in a flash. So, this is much more efficient, cost effective and of course, lot many developments have occurred like uh, rather than just storing charge is present or not present, the quantum of charge is present that also indicates you know, different levels. So, one cell can store several bits of data depending on the levels that are recognized. So, in all these uh, devices whether you talk of a camcorder or you talk of a uh, cell phone, flash memory is used as a permanent memory because these are lightweight, these are uh, consume less power, less costly. Right? So, these are the reasons why all these devices we will look at. Whenever we talk of a permanent memory, we will talk of flash memory and of course, it is much faster than hard disk because uh, these are after all semiconductor memory. So, let us uh, proceed with the other blocks in this. Um, so, we have some human interface for configuration, we will we'll not really bother in this course about this one. And then we have uh, auxiliary systems which are interface to the CPU for controlling power, cooling, all those things, reporting any malfunction, all those. And uh, then we have diagnostic port for running diagnostic applications. And uh, just see here that the signals generated by the external environment are sensed by the sensor and then the system processes this and then the actuators are driven and uh, then this again controls the environment. So, you can think of this part 
as a loop, a feedback loop, right? The environment is getting controlled. Each time events are sensed, corrective actions are taken through the actuator and again the change of that corrective, corrective action is sensed. Now, look at here that there is a electromechanical backup and safety. If the system fails wherever possible, so you will see many applications where such a electromechanical backup safety would not be possible, but many systems it becomes possible and uh, we have this to take over in case this system fails. So, this is one basic diagram we will keep in mind as we proceed. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty of a real time operating system, the different components of it, features and so on, let us uh, just have a rough idea. We, we had so far said that uh, there are external inputs and uh, then there are timing constraints on these the behavior that will be determined based on the input and if the behavior or the response is too long, then we will say that the system fails, but uh, using a general purpose operating system, how do we ensure that? Because there might be several types of events requiring different times by which they might be completing. So, the general purpose operating system, we will also examine this issue in much more depth as we proceed but these uh, can't be used in this kind of applications. So, we will have uh, these real time operating systems whose uh, primary aim would be to help tasks meet the deadlines. How they will meet the deadlines, how deadlines are specified, all those details we will look at later, but uh, just to tell in one sentence this uh, task deadlines, they are met through task scheduling, proper task scheduling and uh, therefore, in this real time operating system area, task scheduling is uh, one of the most important task. You look at any book or whatever, any discussion on real time system, you will see that it revolves around the task scheduler that is the crux of the thing. So, we will spend some time on looking at the features of different schedulers, where they are used, what is their shortcoming, how to select a scheduler for an application, because operating systems might give you facility to configure different types of scheduler in your system. So, we will we'll look at those issues. Now, let us look at some basic characteristics of an embedded system, we will keep this in mind as uh, we proceed. So, one thing which we have said quite a number of time that uh, in a real time system at least some of the tasks or some of the behavior associated with some time constraint. One example of a time constraint is a deadline constraint has to finish by some time. Another type of constraint may be start the task after some time, after a lapse of some time the task should be started. We will see different types of constraints that uh, we will encounter in a real time system. Now, another characteristic here is that uh, just having the result correct is not enough. Suppose the corrective action for a chemical plant when the concentration or the pressure or the temperature changes, the corrective action that needs to be taken may be correct, but unless it is done at the right time that would not be correct, right? it will be a failure still. So, we will consider it as a failure. Now, let us look at the further characteristics. Another one important characteristic is uh, safety and task criticality. We will call a task to be critical when if the task fails, then the system would fail. So, any failure of this task of a critical task would not be accepted. Just to think of an example, let us consider a robo and uh, 
it's moving and encounters an obstacle and suppose the obstacle avoidance task is a bit late, does not meet the deadline, then there will be a collision of the robo and uh, we will say that uh, see the system failed, it could not detect the obstacle and take correct action in time, right. So, that is a critical task. <coughs> And uh, the other concept here, other than the criticality, critical task, if there is a failure, it will fail, the system will fail and a safe, let us look at the concept of safety. A safe system is one, when it fails, does not cause damage, right. If we have a safe system, we will be comfortable that there will be nothing can be really damaging out of it. So, these systems have to be safe because damage will not be tolerated, right, because this damage can be very costly, are used in life saving applications and critical applications like a nuclear power plant. So, we will see how this will be ensured later, but we are just looking at a characteristic that these systems criticality is a characteristic, some of the tasks will be critical, safety requirement and uh, these are called as safety critical, we will elaborate this issue a bit later. We will call these systems to be safety critical, some of these systems where if there is any failure, there will be severe damage that will be caused. Now, there is another characteristic here, important characteristic, true almost universally across all these systems that uh, these are concurrent in the sense that multiple tasks will be active at the same time. All these systems we will see later, multiple tasks will be there and they will be active, but uh, why do we have uh, this requirement? Why is it that there will be multiple tasks, can not one task be enough? To answer this question, we need to see how these operate. Actually, these respond to events and the events can be many like we are saying that there may be pressure sensor, temperature sensor, maybe chemical concentration sensor or maybe in a onboard system might have to sense the uh, altitude, might have to sense the acceleration, speed, all those things. So, multiple events need to be sensed at different intervals because of the characteristics of the sensors or the characteristics of the events themselves and then this has to be processed separately, right, handled and then we will we'll, we'll get more idea as we proceed. Now, <coughs> one consequence of this is that even though the input values are the same, depending on when they occurred the output may be different. Any concurrent system exhibits non-determinism or the output will be different based on how these events are sequenced and in real time system how these are spaced out right in time domain. So, this also we will uh, keep in mind as we proceed important characteristic, I hope it is ok, is not it. And uh, as we are saying that these have feedback structure, because the environment is sensed, the events are processed, actions are taken and the response to that action is again sensed, but these are also distributed in nature, we will see majority of that, large number of that are distributed. Why is that? Because events can occur anywhere. and uh, we need to process those events which have occurred in a over a location, possibly at the same location and store at the same location like we are discussing about the SCADA other applications. Another requirement is a custom hardware for these applications, do not need a general purpose uh, processor or maybe general process purpose sensor or actuator. We might have to design a specific hardware for many of these devices, 
For example, if we have a coffee vending machine, if we use a general processor, it will not fit into this because it will be extremely expensive, isn't it? You need a small processor there. So, we have different kinds of embedded processors. For example, ARM processors are important category of embedded processors, but you will see that the hardware we do not use a general purpose board, general purpose hardware many times just for cost consideration, size consideration, specific characteristics. We need only specific part of the processor. So, why do we invest on a full processor? So, these are some of the reasons why many of these are based on custom hardware. So, this uh, we had seen in some form that uh, the sensors generate signals and uh, the signals are conditioned and read by the processor and computation occurs and then the actuator signals are generated to drive the actuators and there is a feedback nature. So, this is a much more simpler diagram than what we discussed earlier, but let us keep this in mind as we proceed that uh, there will be signal sensed computation occurring on this actuator will act on the environment and uh, the change in the environment will again be sensed. <coughs> a few more characteristics, we, you might also find these terms as uh, you read the literature on real time system. One is called as a reactive system. Actually, many of the applications that we use, for example, you are using a word package, you use it for some time and close it down, right. That is not a reactive system, but uh, a reactive system is one where it just continues to occur over a large period of time. So, there is a ongoing interaction between the computer and the environment over a long period of time unattended by anybody just keeps on working for months or years together. So, this uh, reaction between the computer and the environment over a long period of time is called as reactive, this term is used in the literature. If you read a book or a paper, you will come across this term. Another term that we will also use as we proceed is uh, stability. Now, let us uh, get this term clarified that uh, sometimes events, see events when they occur, we do not have much control. We have control on the system, but environment will behave on its own way. And what if several events occur at the same time? Let us say all these are being sensed, the um, temperature, pressure, etcetera, and also there is a fire situation which is monitored. So, several events will get generated at the same time and can the system process all these at the same time. So, that is a overload situation and if the system fails under this system situation, then we will say that the system is unstable under heavy load. So, this will be an important consideration as we look at the operating systems and so on. We will talk about whether the system is stable under overload situations. Is that okay? The stability under overload situation. Okay. Let us look further. Another one will be exception handling. In case some exception events occur, how this will be handled, we will also discuss uh, in the context of the operating system, exception handling. Now, let us elaborate this concept of safety and reliability, because important issue in a real time system. In a traditional system, see we have these concepts also safety and reliability in traditional systems and uh, there we have uh, these concepts of a safe system and reliable are independent. For example, we will have a safe system which is not reliable and we can have a reliable system, but not safe. We had already seen this actually, a safe system even if it fails, no damage will result. On the other hand, a reliable system, 
is one which operates for long periods of time without any failure being encountered, then we will call it as a reliable system. In traditional systems, safety we can no, increase safety or we can increase reliability without affecting each other. And we have we can also have systems which are safe but unreliable, unreliable and unsafe, reliable and unsafe and so on. In the real life situation, can you give an example of a safe system, but which is unreliable. Can anybody give an example of a safe system? Yes. Mobile phone. Mobile phone is reliable, is not it? I do not know what kind of mobile phone you have, but normally these are quite reliable, is not it? Work for long period of time, not much failure. Reliable, mobile phone is supposed to be reliable. Anybody has any example of a real life situation, need not be a computer or anything. In a real life, can somebody tell a system or a uh, artifact or whatever, which is uh, a weather, forecast system. weather forecast system, is it unreliable? I mean, it works. Uh, very unreliable. Uh, okay, I mean, as long as the letters you send, if they are lost, you don't mind, right? Then it is. Uh, you can say that it is a safe system because even if letters are lost, e e it doesn't really hurt you. Or maybe a email system where emails may get lost. They are getting lost, right? So this is safe. But again, unreliable email, no, we have seen it does not reach. But uh, what about the other example? We have seen a safe and unreliable system, or uh, the another example can be that you have developed a word processing software, right? Uh, crashes very frequently, like earlier times, the word processors used to crash. Now they are more stable, and uh, before it crashes, it just saves the data. So you don't lose much. It's only irritation that you need to start again and again. But uh, you don't lose much data, right? That is another example of a safe and uh, unreliable system. What about an unsafe and reliable system? Can somebody give an example? Okay, unsafe. Why is it unsafe? Because it's, 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 there is surgery going on. it's a cardiac monitor example you gave, right? So why is it unsafe? If, if a surgery is going on, then okay. if it fails at that time, okay. the patient can die because. Okay. Yes. Mm, okay. Yeah. Right. But uh, there can be several examples. You can just say that a gun, right? It's very reliable. Doesn't fail normally. But if it fails or let us say the you are firing, it does not really, I mean it explodes, there is a problem, it happens. No? So, it is a safe and uh, it is unsafe but reliable system. Okay, now, let us proceed further. In traditional systems, safety and reliability are independent issues, we had seen, you can have systems safe, unreliable, unreliable, unsafe and so on. But uh, in a real time application, which are many of them are safety critical, and in this kind of application, any failure of the system would result in severe damage, right. So, we cannot let the system fail, and also it has to be you no, know, should not cause damage. Just see here cannot let the system fail and cannot cause damage even if it fails, right. So, these are called as safety critical. Now, let us see the implication of this. The implication is that safety and uh, reliability are no more independent issues. They are dependent on each other. 
it has to be reliable and also at the same time safe okay so how, how do we get that we have to have increased reliability, it should never fail, so one possibility, it should never fail. In a traditional system, you can make an unreliable system to be safe by reverting to a fail safe state, just let us take that example of a word processor, you had valuable data and uh, it was unreliable, but uh, before it crashed or something, it just saved the data, right. So, there is a safe state for that. If the safe, it fails in the safe state, all data has been saved, then you do not lose much. So, it is an unreliable system, but we have made it safe just by transiting to a uh, safe state during failure or let us uh, ok. So, a safe state is one where no damage will result if the system fails in the fail safe state. So, if a fail safe state exists, we can convert a unsafe unreliable system to a safe system, we will just uh, transit to the safe state, this is an example here. See the a traffic light controller in the road intersection, even if it fails, it uh, leaves the lights orange and blinking. This is a safe state here. Suppose it failed with the lights all green at the intersection, it will become unsafe, accidents people will rush in. If it fails in all red, that will be unsafe also, is not it? Traffic will become a standstill. But if it there is a safe state like orange and blinking, people know that it is not working, they proceed with their discretion. So, we will also use these terms a fail safe state, safety criticality, safety and uh, reliability, all these terms we will use it. Uh, I hope uh, these terms are clear. Okay. Okay, this we had already seen that for a unreliable uh, document processing system or a word processing system, the fail safe state is saving the document in the disk. <coughs> so, a fail safe state actually helps to separate the safety and reliability issues. because we can have an unreliable system and we can make it safe, right. But unfortunately, <coughs> in real time systems, safety critical systems, we will see that there are no fail safe states, otherwise we would not have much problem. Even if it fails, we will, we will change it to or we will, uh, we will make the system fail in a fail safe state. Unfortunately, for this system as you will see shortly fail safe systems do not exist in a safety critical system. Okay. So, an unreliable system can be converted to a safe system, unreliable and unsafe system can be converted to a safe system just by making it fail in a fail safe state. Right. Now, as we will see the safety critical systems there exists no fail safe state. If it was a <coughs> system where fail safe states exist and even if it is a critical system could possibly have con uh, we would have uh, uh, changed the state to a fail safe state and no damage would result. Now, let us take an example. Let us say there is a autopilot system and the plane is flying and uh, suddenly the system fails, right, then what will be the fail safe state? Would uh, shutting down the engine help? Would uh, No, it will still fall, is not it? So, it can be taken over by manual. Okay, but uh, 
if the man, manual pilot exists and he can control, but many of these autopilot, you know, they, they just fly by themselves and sometimes it is not possible for the auto uh, manual pilot to take over a plane. For example, let us see this uh, plane, supersonic commercial plane, have you heard of this Concorde? Anybody heard of Concorde flight? So, it was a supersonic flight operated between I think London and New York. The normal planes would take something like 8 hours and this is a supersonic commercial plane. See, we have seen supersonic planes at the jet fighter planes and uh, uh, military applications, but there is a commercial plane and uh, used to operate uh, 4 hours it used to take and then just crashed and uh, they just said that the autopilot system failed, but nothing could be done, it flies at that speed and uh, a large aircraft, even if a pilot is there, he will be a little you know, control, he can control such a large plane, the kind of response time etc. will be required at that speed will be difficult, is not it. So, for such systems, the safety critical system is not even asking for the manual pilot to take over, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, for a safety critical system, the only way we can make it safe by making it extremely reliable for a million flying hours, one failure, million flying hours, right? That is the requirement of the Federal Aviation Agency, extremely reliable. Okay, let us proceed further. So, just to summarize what we discussed, a safety critical system is one where any failure can cause severe damage and no fail safe state exists in these safety critical systems. So, cannot even revert to a fail safe state. So, the reliability will be in increased only through the safety will be ensured only by increasing the reliability, making it extremely reliable. But uh, the question is that if you want to develop a highly reliable system, how do you do that? Let us not worry about hardware because that is not our domain. Let us see as far as uh, software is concerned, how do you develop a extremely reliable software. Yes, anybody would like to answer? How, how do you develop extremely reliable software? Okay, testing. Okay, he says testing. Yes, we have to test them, but uh, we know that testing does not really reveal all problems in a system. Even after you are thoroughly tested, you cannot guarantee that uh, there are no problems. So, what do you do? Testing, yes, you have to test it very thoroughly, correct, but uh, that do not really solve the problem. Sir, we can uh, use the development methodology like some models. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, to reduce the scope of error, you can use some methodology which will reduce the chances of errors, but still there will be some errors remain. You cannot guarantee that it is, there are no errors in the system. For large systems at the present moment, it is impossible to guarantee that there will be no failure. So, in case of a failure, you will have to provide for fault tolerance. Even if the system fails, there should be some mechanism in the system which will in the form of a redundancy possibly that it will take over, right. Even if the supposed to have failed, another thing will take over and it will not really fail. So, let us uh, see these approaches. So, one is error avoidance as uh, you are saying there that uh, we can use some systematic methodology where we reduce the chances of error we avoid errors. The other is testing, detect errors and then we remove the errors, De uh, test it thoroughly and still there will be chances of problems. 
because you can't really test with all exhaustive values. There are too many of that to be able to test in a reasonable time. So, we will have to have fault tolerance features in this kind of safety critical systems. Even if no, fail safe is a state. Okay, let me just repeat his question. Says that the terms fail safe and fault tolerance appear to be confusing. That is the question. See, fail safe is the system fails, but while failing, it just uh, fails in a state where damage will not occur. But in fault tolerance, we are saying that even if there is a problem somewhere, we are masking it by some means and how we are masking is through redundancy. For example, it is very easy to consider the case of a hardware, a processor man malfunctioned or a sensor malfunctioned. We have another redundant sensor, we will just reconfigure that the processor takes over and even the one processor has failed or a sensor has failed, we will not really notice that for the operation it will make little impact even if the processor that was working that really failed because another extra processor has taken over. So, that is a example of a fault tolerance. Is that okay? Okay, let us uh, proceed. Fault tolerance in hardware is uh, very intuitive. If you talk to persons working in the hardware area, they say that yes, uh, the hardware that we develop are fault tolerant and there is a standard technique called as triple modular redundancy built in self test. So, you just uh, find errors and uh, then you invoke another one or you do a voting right, you have three redundant pieces all working at the same time and uh, then if uh, one of them fails, the other two the results will differ and you know that there is a failure, right? And then you remove that one which failed and use that majority result. Standard technique, triple modular redu redundancy is a standard hardware fault tolerance techniques. But we will see that in case of software which is the disc our current discussion, it is a very tricky issue. Let us see what are the approaches to fault tolerance in software and uh, what are their problems because we have to keep this in mind as we proceed. See, I, we had seen that the idea behind any fault tolerant system is to have some form of redundancy, maybe redundancy of components, redundancy of programs or maybe redundancy of some activity. In hardware, in a hardware fault tolerance, we can easily mask the fault of the hardware as I said with triple modular redundancy, but uh, the fault may be due to software and that is more likely because hardware nowadays are so reliable, they hardly fail, but even if there are chances of failure, we can provide fault tolerance in hardware very, very easily, but if the fault is due to a software. Even if you have hardware redundancy, all those nothing will work, right? It will still fail. So, how do you provide software fault tolerance? There is a bug in the program. How do you really provide a to fault tolerance feature in software? Anybody would like to answer this question? I am sorry, can like exception handling. not exception handling actually. See the let us say the program has uh, gone into an infinite loop. So, what do you do? Exception handling is not really fault tolerance. Any, any, anybody else would like to answer? No, but the software running and the same is not it, even in a distributed system the same software will run there. So, there is a bug and it will fail again for the same reason. Sir, can we have a monitor a program sort of in the time actually, actually it is sort of it exactly. No, how, how, how will you overcome? See again if you 
uh, run that software, again that problem will come up. And you run another copy, that problem will be there. Like he was saying in a distributed, we have another copy which will run, but again that problem will come up. Okay. So, there are two standard approaches to software fault tolerance. Now, let us look at these approaches. One is called as inversion programming and the other is called as recovery block, two very popular software fault tolerance approaches used also in practical situations, but uh, we will see that not effective. Software fault tolerance still becomes, still remains a very challenging issue. No really good technique like hard, hardware fault tolerance exists. Now, let us look at this inversion programming. Actually, the inversion programming is based on the hardware redundancy uh, technique of triple modular redundancy or TMR. In a TMR, as we are saying that there are redundant components, three of them we have, even though one could have served, we have three of them repeated and uh, we take the voting of the results and use the majority result. Now, this is extended to the software domain. How, how do we extend this to the software domain? In software domain, we create different versions of the software. We have uh, independent teams that are working. So, the same problem, three different teams, they are developing three versions of the software and hoping that they will not commit identical mistakes in their code or their algorithm. They might use different algorithms also, right, because they are working independently. Hoping that the different versions of the software will be different, we can make them work at the same time and then take the voting, but again is not a very effective technique. Unsatisfactory performance, why is that? Actually, even if we have independent persons, independent teams working, but uh, when you actually run them, you find that the faults or the fa un under the conditions they fail are identical or the faults are similar. Why is that? Because uh, teams were different, different types of people working at different places, they do not even talk to each other. No, input is the same, but uh, like let us say a programmer committed a mistake and uh, there uh, we have a different programmer, he might not commit the same mistake, but we are finding that they are failing in similar reasons, why is that? No, designed also differently. The different teams, they do their design requirements, they do their coding, testing independently. Even they are following the same programming methodology. Need not be. They might use different uh, program yeah, uh, methodology. Related to the complexity of the modular. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that is the answer. See, the thing is that even if the programmers are at different places, they are working without talking to each other. But the part of the program where one team finds difficulty and likely to do mistakes is the same for an, any other team. They find that the same modules are difficult to code and their errors remain, right. So, maybe for that reason, the inversion programming is not very effective. I mean, it might work for some simple programming errors which one team committed, another team did not commit. But for majority of the errors, it does not work actually, because these are identical errors in the different versions of the program. Okay. Now, let us uh, look at the other technique, the recovery block technique. Here we have uh, different, uh, a task is divided into tri blocks. Okay. So, one task is divided into four tri blocks.
okay, let me just correct myself. These are not diff, uh, the task is not really. Uh, these are not really uh, TB1, TB2, which are the tri blocks. These are not really uh, division of a uh, task into these four blocks, but a task is divided into four or maybe more blocks, which we don't see here. See these tri blocks that we see here are same tri block, right? I mean, same type of programming, same part of the task they are doing. These are redundant copies again. But the thing is that <coughs> only one operates, tri block one operates, and then the result is tested. If it is a failure, try to use another tri block. Again, the result is test tested. So, here just see that uh, they are not really redundant copies or different versions, but these are different tri blocks that are run one after other and um, in a real time situation by the time the tri block 1 is completed it takes some time. So, you have still less time remaining to try the other tri block. So, possibly you can have a simpler algorithm here or maybe you can um, sacrifice accuracy or something. And uh, these use deliberately different algorithms. So, this is also another way to uh, provide software fault tolerance, but again the same problem, correlation of the errors and is not very effective. Yeah, right. So, uh, all the four blocks have the same code. Yes. So, one fails, then it is obvious that the other also fails at the same point. Uh, how are they providing for the No, see here the tri block one is the actual module, right. And uh, we test it. If it is a failure, we try a simpler algorithm which is uh, using a different approach, a different, algorithm. different algorithm deliberately different each tri block is deliberately a different similar algorithm inversion. sorry similar to inversion. in inversion we don't say that they are different algorithms we say that independent teams they might use the same algorithm it might be standard they just don't talk to each other right so maybe if it is a standard uh, let's say a quick sort algorithm is used by one team the another team might also use the same algorithm because that's the most effective at that time right but here we are saying that do not use the same approach, deliberately use different approach and of course, these have to be progressively simpler algorithms with sacrificing accuracy because time is becoming smaller and smaller, right. The time remaining to complete is smaller and smaller. And once we have these tri blocks, if there is a, we can also restart it that is one thing that we need to understand that uh, see the input has been processed here, but we can the tri block 2 can be restarted because we have to recover we can go to a previous state a recovery state and from that state we will try the tri block. So, each tri block after completion we will have a recovery state where we just store all the results we can always go back to that state and then restart right that's the idea okay we have what we have showed is tb2 in case of a failure is invoked okay i think there is a inaccuracy uh, inaccuracy in the sense that it will revert back it will recover uh, i mean it will go back to the previous state so, we will just stop here and uh, we will continue in the next lecture.